The Arizona State Legislature has not released its budget for the next fiscal year, but groups all over the state are watching and waiting to see what state leaders come up with and how the budget might impact their services. Educators are particularly worried. Arts help foster, well, not only creativity, but it helps with every aspect from kindergarten level all the way up to college level and beyond. The governor proposed a $9.4 billion budget, a significant increase from this year. But will members of the legislature and the governor come to an agreement soon? I would say we're probably talking mid-May. Um, I mean, I don't think you'll see a situation where we go into June as we did in the past. This is Arizona Week. Medicaid dominated last year's budget talks. Arizona's Medicaid program, known as ACCESS, increased in size this year, effective January 1. Thousands of people have already applied, and El Rio Community Health Center in Tucson has already seen an increase in patients. Well, the first thing that I would like to do is go over your labs. El Rio Community Health Clinic in Tucson prides itself on 42 years of offering service to everyone and anyone who needs health care. Linda Williams, a physician here for nearly 15 years, sees a wide range of patients. Today, a woman on Medicare. The clinic has 18 sites throughout Tucson, 120 physicians who manage the health of 80,000 patients. Chief Financial Officer Celia Hightower couldn't be more proud of her staff's mission to help people. The demographic, a lot of people think it's Hispanic or it's the wide gamut, white, African American, Asian, we have even some Ethiopians that are living in uh, their new residence to our community. So we serve everyone from the richest to the poorest. And that's really important message to be sent. We're your community health center. The clinics offer everything from x-rays to a full pharmacy. A steady flow of patients, El Rio is bracing for an increase, the result of Arizona's Medicaid expansion. We have been very busy and that's good, amen for that. And we've seen the patients coming in and applying. They started applying in October and they knew their application had to be on hold until January 1 when it became law. And when they come in with their letter saying they've been accepted, it's, it's the happiest day for them. Just four months into the expansion, Sandra Leal, a pharmacist, says she's already seen a change in her patients. I'm seeing a lot of relief from patients. You know, I have patients that have diabetes. They've had diabetes for a number of years, and they require a specialist visits. So sometimes not having insurance was a detrimental for them. They couldn't make it. They couldn't afford the co-pays, or if something more had to happen, a, a test or a follow-up, they couldn't afford that. Leal says she knows patients have ignored their health because they simply couldn't afford the care. Diabetes is very expensive. Aside from having diabetes, there's multiple medications. People take six to 12 medications. They have to go see an eye doctor once a year, a foot exam once a year, lab work that's required, um, and then the supplies, the testing supplies, making sure they're eating the right types of foods. It's very costly, so I can see why it's really difficult for people. They have to make a choice sometimes between paying for visits to the doctor or paying for their grocery bills. A fear people like Enrique Sandoval know all too well. This 24-year-old is about to graduate from college and hasn't had health insurance in years. Basically what drew me in was I did not want to get fined because of the health care law. And, um, but then I started realizing how important it was and um, it just gave me that much more of a reason to come in and, and just be educated on it. After talking with Raymond Valenzuela, a community health advisor at El Rio, Enrique learned that he qualifies for ACCESS, Arizona's Medicaid program. But all things point aside that you're going to be getting ACCESS. All right. A weight Any lifted questions? off the shoulders of this part-time worker. Very relieved, very relieved to know that, um, that if anything happens, I'm going to be okay. Um, I won't worry my parents and um, I'm excited and happy for it, yeah. El Rio says it is committed to hiring more application counselors like Raymond to help guide people. This was not hard at all. It was not hard at all. And that was one of my uh, fears is 
where to look for it, you know, uh, who to talk to and, and uh, having the time available to do it. This was just, I came in and got helped right away. So uh, it, it, it's that much more of a relief to come in and do it. And a relief for the families the clinic serves. It's knowledge. If they don't have the knowledge, they may not apply. And we don't want them to go without a service that they, they qualify for. Medicaid, though, is not on the front burner of this year's budget debate. Arizona Public Media's Christopher Conover sat down with John Cavanaugh, the House Budget Chair. Last year, one of the big hang-ups, of course, was the governor's uh, desire for expanding Medicaid. We haven't heard anything quite like that. Is there any big stumbling block? And yes, we have a long way to go, but is there a big stumbling block that you're seeing at this point? The major stumbling blocks that we have now are um, agreements not so much on the different blocks of spending, uh, although we always have a disagreement on how much. Uh, historically, the legislature uh, doesn't want to spend as much as the executive. And, and I don't know if that's so much uh, an issue of political philosophy, because the, the governor is a conservative Republican also, as it is uh, that a chief executive, which is what the governor is, uh, always has a, a, a desire for more money because the, he or she has to execute and their agencies require money to do that. Uh, whereas as the legislature, we are more budget and bottom line minded and, and we look more at what will this do to Arizona's uh, budget this year and more importantly three years out. Uh, so that's one area. But we do have other differences that we have to iron out in the beginning. One is the uh, projection of revenue. Uh, again, the governor usually projects more revenue than the legislature does. Uh, she tends to be uh, historically a little bit more correct than us because we, we tend to be more prudent. But there is also an issue of, of can we agree on the revenue? Because obviously if you over project revenue, you can spend more and still have what looks like a balanced budget. And then there are certain uh, presumptions that are made about how many additional prisoners, students, Medicaid cases, welfare cases uh, are you going to have. And if you underestimate that, then you can spend more because you're not using as much money. So those are the things that we initially work out with the governor. We have to get agreement on that. And then the issue becomes how much above last year's spending do we want to spend? And most importantly, we then look out three years, which we're now required to do by law, and we say what will the state's fund balance be in three years if we do this spending with these presumptions of, of revenue and, and, and caseloads. You mentioned a lot of the stumbling blocks are much more process, if you will, agreeing, and obviously very important, agreeing how much money there really is to work with. Are there any big bills that are sitting out there or ideas that will require funding that are going to slow the process, or is everything going fairly smoothly in that way? No, budget bills that are proceeding separately, and there are a handful, uh, really have no effect on the process because everybody realizes that in the end, it's the negotiations between the chambers that, that matter. Most of the budget bills that you see going through, even though they're passing, in the end will be stopped before there's a final vote uh, because we don't negotiate the budget piecemeal through bills. It's a uh, holistic process, if I may borrow from uh, you know, the new age. Uh, so, uh, and it involves a lot of compromise. Uh, we have a lot of cooks. You, know, you, you need 31 out of 60 cooks in the House and 16 out of uh, 30 cooks in the Senate. And then, of course, the chef master governor who can veto things. Uh, so, you know, this is a situation where I won't say too many cooks spoil the broth, but too many cooks certainly slow down the preparation of the broth. You've been around the, uh, the legislative block a couple of times. What's your feeling realistically how easily or how quickly this can get done? I know leadership at the beginning of the session said, oh, we're out of here, end of April, beginning of May. Of course, the budget uh, may have something to say with that. Or, or is that realistic or do you see more mid-May, late May? I would say we're probably talking mid-May. Um, I mean, I don't think you'll see a situation where we go into June as we did in the past, mainly because the elephant in the room, of course, is will the governor uh, grab a handful of Republicans and all the Democrats and, and do her, uh, their own budget instead of the, the Republican chamber's budget, which is what happened last year. Uh, with that possibility always looming uh, over us, uh, 
it, it certainly uh, is going to create a situation where we'll either settle pretty quickly or get rolled over pretty quickly. It doesn't feel like, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that there is that elephant. I mean, the elephant is always in the room, but it doesn't feel like the elephant is quite so large this year. Last year, we had that Medicaid elephant sitting in the room, and that's what the governor did. Uh, this year, it doesn't seem like we have quite so big an elephant. Is that is that a correct assessment? Yeah. Uh, the Actually, the, the real reason for the unusual ending last year was, in fact, the, the Medicaid expansion, which was the key issue. Uh, I think it was a matter of convenience for the other side to simply strap the budget onto the elephant. Uh, but yeah, without the element, I, I, I think it will be more harmonious. Uh, and hopefully each side will give and take and, and we'll have something that we can, that's basically conservative and, and that we can go back to our districts as Republicans anyway and, uh, and brag about and Democrats can go back to their districts and gin up the vote and scream about you know, and everybody gets something politically anyway and hopefully the, 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 the citizens will get reasonable uh, increases in expenditures in the important areas like, like education, child protective services, public safety. Based on what we consider to be reasonable revenue projections, uh, if we just passed the baseline budget, which is last year's budget, plus increases uh, for inflation and added populations in schools, prisons, welfare, and, 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 and Medicaid, if we only did that and didn't do a dime of discretionary increases like CPS, which we will handle, but we didn't do any of that, we will still be about $330 million in the red in 2017 because we continue to spend more money than we take in. That's been since the 2009 recession. We're only balancing the books now because we save some of the temporary uh, sales tax money. That runs out in 17. And doing nothing but baseline what we have to do for the next three years puts us $333 million in the hole in 2017. Uh, we're going to be doing discretionary increases. That's unavoidable. Uh, so we're looking at a, a real fiscal canyon in 2017 and the possibility that we may very well be doing a billion dollars in cuts in the budget, uh, assuming the economy doesn't get on steroids, which nobody predicts it will. Every year, school districts in Arizona have faced funding cuts, forcing them to become more creative to try and save certain programs. For example, Sunnyside Unified School District redesigned its art and music department to make sure students are still receiving the best education possible. Arizona Public Media's Alexandra Salazar has a story. Work on adding to your pictures, color it in, make it amazing. You guys know how to do that. Julie Faust is the art teacher at Gallegos Elementary School in the Sunnyside School District. Arts help foster not only creativity, but it helps with every aspect from kindergarten level all the way up to college level and beyond. It helps students think outside the box with critical test taking skills and 21st century skills. You know, you think about all the fine motor skills that it develops, you know, the arts really give a rounded education to the kids. This art and music department is being redesigned because of cuts to state funding. As a result, teachers like Faust are having to become more creative in the classroom. You're welcome, my dear. Schools have had to work incredibly hard to maintain programming such as music and art. And I will, you know, uh, say that many, many schools have had to eliminate um, arts entirely, which I think is, you know, a tragedy. Assistant Superintendent Jan Vesley believes art plays a critical role in education, something she noticed when she started her career. I walked into my school and I began to think about what made me want to get up in the morning and go to school when I was a child. And it was distinctly clear to me that it was the arts that brought so much joy into my life. It made me connected to school, it made me feel vibrant, and it made me feel alive. Vesley says Sunnyside is a high poverty district and programs like arts and music expose children. I want um, the community to know how Sunnyside Unified School District sincerely values the arts. And, what, and we are a very high poverty district, but what we see is we don't always um, see the benefit of the arts at the elementary level. We see the joy it brings, we see the engagement for kids that it brings, but where we really start feeling the effects of fine arts programming is when kids get to the high school level because by that time it really, um, by having these early uh, childhood experiences in 
and, and exposure to both music and art, we're able to see and reap the benefits for these students when they get to secondary schools like middle school and high school in terms of their academic achievement. Faust is among the teachers who will be part of the district's redesign. She'll rotate between schools to make sure students receive the highest level of art education. Well, the redesign started when, due to budget cut issues, we had to look critically at what needed to be done. And so th with the redesign, we are currently going from 12 positions down to seven. And so they're going to be half-time oh, positions. The district hopes the redesign saves the existing program and inspires these children. Students gain a lot. A lot of the students, you know, from kindergarten up through high school, the one thing I hear the students tell me so many times, Miss Julie, I cannot wait to go see you. You are the reason I wanted to come today. I was so excited because I got to go to art. You know, and the music is the same. We are what brings enjoyment to the students, and I think that's a positive. They want to come. The governor proposed a $3.9 billion education budget for 2015, a $300,000 increase from this year. To talk more about education funding is Arizona House Minority Leader Bruce Wheeler. This is the time of year where we begin to hear budget discussions. Uh, bills haven't moved yet, the bill, but we're starting to hear discussions. From the Democratic perspective, what needs to be in that bill and what needs to not be in that bill this year? Well, primarily from our perspective, the Democratic Party, we need to address education. So we primarily there is Common Core funding. Uh, the governor supports Common Core, but there's no funding for it. And we need to have a $13.5 million allocation for the assessment testing because we're going to transition from the Ames testing to the new common core uh, structure, so that's essential to have. And then at the University of Arizona, we were left out of any consideration in this year's budget by the governor. So some of us uh, feel very strongly that we need to at least address a $15 million research and development high-tech bioscience uh, application to the university budget. So we're going to try, we're going to give it our best shot, and hopefully we'll have some successes. Democrats in recent years have not uh, been necessarily the most successful being the minority party. How hopeful are you that Representative Kavanaugh, uh, Speaker Tobin, the leadership in the Senate, the governor's office will, will listen to the minority party? Well, I think there's a chance because the governor is interested in her legacy and education is one of those legacies. Last year, a success was Medicaid expansion. And so we Democrats are trying to form the alliance again that we enjoyed last year with a handful of Republicans to address those education issues. And so I feel confident in discussions that I've had so far with a handful of Republicans. They will support the Common Core funding and they will support the U of A uh, application, uh, funding application. But that doesn't mean we're going to succeed, but we are going to give it every effort. Do you get a seat at the table uh, as the Democrat, you the Democrats get an actual seat at the table uh, during the the discussions that are ongoing now uh, before things really get written down and on the floor? If we're needed, and I hope to be needed. <laughs> um, and, and that's a real serious answer. I mean, if, if we are needed, we will have a seat. Uh, if we're not, we're irrelevant. But I think this year, because of the support we have from some Republicans for the university, and again, Common Core, a very big issue with Republicans in the Senate in the last week and this week, um, that those more moderate Republicans have joined all the Democrats to support the Common Core standards that I think are essential. There was the vote last week for Common Core to, to get to prohibit the state from participating. It went down on the floor, so that must have given you a little bit of hope that uh, maybe the money will come around now. We think there's an opt we're optimistic. Um, we think there's a good chance it will happen, and yes, uh, uh, Senator Worsley is one of those leading Republicans, uh, the majority leader in the Senate also. So there are obstacles, but we do we are optimistic with some of the support. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Republican-Democratic relations this year. Last year, as you said, that coalition was formed, a handful of Republicans, uh, including Ethan Orr from Tucson, uh, worked with Democrats to get Medicaid through. How are relations this year? Uh, you've alluded that you're trying to put that group back together, so it wasn't just a one-time deal. We're hoping that it's not a one-time deal. And so far, the Common Core battles in the Senate 
uh, have proven that that alliance is well and alive and successful. So um, we're hoping to uh, expand that over to the House, and I think we will. Another um, going from education to infrastructure, roads, and the highway user revenue funds, which are really critical and have been stripped for the last several years. Um, there was a bipartisan effort, even with the speaker, to join us in, in, in applying her funding to road maintenance and repair. So we think that that coalition is alive. Uh, we've noticed that the animosity between the Republicans who oppose Medicaid expansion uh, toward those that supported Democrats for expansion, uh, at least publicly, it's gone. And that's a positive sign. If you get the education fund you're looking for, is that the big victory that you, know, you can go home happily, or are there other things in the budget that you're hopeful between the coalition and just some good old fashioned uh, arm, arm twisting and politicking you can get in? I'd like to push my luck, but I'm a realist. I think if we can claim victory on education funding, to me that's the single most important issue in our state, um, I'll go home happy. But that does not mean that there are unmet needs. There are many unmet needs. This is an election year, and hopefully we'll be able to address those and make improvements to address those remaining issues next year. You bring up an election year. Uh, leadership has talked since the beginning of session wanting to get out as quickly as possible. Uh, there are campaigns to be run uh, for, at, at, for various offices. Uh, does the election year help or hinder uh, the budget process from the minority party's standpoint? I think it's going to help us, and, and not only because people are noticing how extreme the Republican Party has become. We're debating ridiculous bills on guns and gun legislation this year, allowing guns on campus, for instance. Uh, the 1062, the attempt to codify discrimination against the gay community, uh, that was a major defeat for the right wing. And, and the extremists in that party, I think, are vulnerable, and we Democrats are certainly going to make those extreme issues, which do affect the budget, do affect education, infrastructure, jobs, and the economy, because, surprise, not surprisingly, but we've had chambers of commerce across the state supporting Democratic positions and opposing the Republican extremist positions. So we think it's, these are good issues to carry into this election year. We feel very confident that the public is listening. The impact is devastating for this state. Our image is hurting, and that's not good for our economic development. And yes, there's the urgency of elections. The Speaker is running for Congress, and we're all running for re-election. So yes, release us from this burden, and let us go home and campaign and get something done, hopefully with education. Christopher Conover, that was an interesting interview there. A lot of talk about the budget, but no hard dates to look for just yet. No hard dates, and that's pretty typical at this point. Right now, leadership from both chambers and both parties are talking to their members, seeing what they really need, have to have in there in order to go home. Then a bill will be crafted. I won't say behind closed doors, but it won't be in big committee meetings, and then the full bill will be presented. And the goal is uh, right now probably mid-May to finish it up and get out. Okay. Uh, something else that came out this week, more conversation about the Common Core. Exactly. As we heard, uh, Representative Wheeler really wants a lot of funding for Common Core in the budget. That's the Democrats' big push this year, as we heard in those interviews. Last week, there was a bill run by Senator Al Melvin from Southern Arizona to prohibit the state from using Common Core. That died in the Senate. This week, there was a bill that came up that would allow school boards to opt out of Common Core or any other standard adopted by the State Board of Education and come up with their own. Uh, that is moving pretty well through the House. Now, once it gets over to the Senate, which already killed the first uh, prohibition on Common Core, it may have a more difficult time, but it is moving pretty well through the House right now. And you've covered education for a while. Is that something that maybe school districts would want to at least have the option to, to opt out of? My guess is the school boards would prefer to have one set of standards to work with. For example, here in Tucson, if you think of all the different school districts we have, they could each have a different set of standardized tests, which could make life a little bit more difficult, to say the least. Okay. Um, interesting note that came out of the Capitol this week. Governor Jan Brewer said she would not seek another term. We've talked about this before on this program. It was highly unlikely that she had any ground in that department anyway because of the way the legislation was written. So who are possible candidates moving forward? 
Well, she did. She went back and announced at a, at a public school where she says it kind of all began, uh, where, where she decided to get involved in politics when her own kids were in school. And she announced that it's time to, in her words, pass the torch. Now, she also didn't say she was leaving politics. She's just leaving the governor's office when her term is up at the end of this year. This is a free-for-all. The last time we had a true open seat uh, was more than a decade ago, and Janet Napolitano was elected to her first term. Right now, there are, according to the Secretary of State's website, 17 different people mainly Republicans and Democrats, but some minor party uh, candidates also, in the race to be governor. These are people who have filed the paperwork to actually run for governor at this point. And we have some names that you've identified as potential serious candidates based on their previous history in politics. Right, the names that people will recognize, Doug Ducey, he's the state treasurer, Ken Bennett, the secretary of state, former state uh, senator, Scott Smith, the mayor of Mesa, Senator Al Melvin, who's a state senator, Christine Jones, the former head of GoDaddy.com, Andrew Thomas, the Maricopa County prosecutor from a few years ago, Fred Duval on the Democratic side, all those others were Republicans. Uh, there is one other Democrat in the race, uh, Jeffrey Jacobs, but Fred Duval is the big name in the Democratic race, almost his alone. Any predictions at this point? Anyone you think definitely ha has um, an opportunity here? The opportunity, unless something drastic happens or somebody else gets in on the Democratic side, will be Fred Duval. Uh, on the Republican side, it is too early. Everybody, some of those bigger names are polling pretty evenly, but they're all polling in single digits right now. It's still very early. We have good name recognition for Ken Bennett, Scott Smith, Doug Ducey because of a little bit higher profile. But if you went out on the street, a lot of people may not know exactly who the state treasurer is. Very early in the process, very expensive. Those 17 names, we'll certainly see that list whittle down as we get closer to election time. Yes, we will. It, the, a lot of these names, the minor party candidates, if we were to read their names now, it may be one of the few times they're actually mentioned mm -hmm. by name. Some of the others on the Republican side, that's the crowded side right now. Those names will whittle out over time based on can they collect money, uh, you know, can they get their name recognition out. Um, Ken Bennett, Doug Ducey, Scott Smith, Christine Jones, Andrew Thomas are going to be the names we hear over and over again. And as the summer goes by, those names will whittle down. Okay, Christopher Conover, thank you so much for your excellent reports this week. And that does it for this edition of Arizona Week. Thank you so much for being here. For all of us at Arizona Week, I'm Lorraine Rivera.